bless the name of our God who's worthy to be praised. My, my. As we continue our series on bended knee, looking at various individuals who teach us poignant and practical principles pertaining to the principle and the power of prayer, I would ask once again that you would turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel, um, a word that I believe will, what I pray will bless someone on today. On this Mother's Day, we want to lift up a very familiar passage of scripture and a story that is uh, familiar to many of us. 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I want to read in your hearing just one verse this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 1. The first chapter of 1 Samuel and the 10th verse, hear ye the word of the Lord. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of our God. On this Mother's Day, I want to tag this text in our exchange, just as I am. Just as I am. Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places with no carpet bare. These are the words, some of the words from that famous poem by one Langston Hughes entitled Mother to son. And as many of you are familiar with this poem, you see that the mother is talking to her son, telling her how life has not been easy, telling her son that life has not been a walk in the park, but rather she testifies that there have been some arduous and difficult days that she has experienced. And if I were a betting man, I've got a funny feeling and a sneaky suspicion that there's someone under the sound of my voice this morning who holds to the same sentiments which are expressed in the aforementioned poem. For there's somebody under the sound of my voice, you can testify that life has not always been easy, but there have been some difficult days in your life. As a matter of fact, there's someone right now under the sound of my voice, you're saying to yourself, Pastor, you don't even have to say life hasn't been easy because the truth of the matter is right now life is not easy. There, there's someone under the sound of my voice. You're saying, Pastor, I acknowledge that you recognize the newest mother. You acknowledge the eldest mother. You acknowledge the mother with the most children. But, Pastor, if you had a category that said moms who have been to hell and back. Mom, if you had a category that said moms who felt like giving up and giving in. 
moms who, if there was a category that said moms who felt like throwing in the towel, pastor, I would win that category hands down. And this, my brothers and my sister, is where Hannah finds herself in 1 Samuel chapter 1. But when we come to 1 Samuel chapter 1, we discover that Hannah is not in a place of comfort, but rather Hannah is in a place of crisis. Watch how the text unfolds. Notice number one, the text shows us Hannah's situation. Can the church say situation? situation. Notice what the text says right there in verse 2. The text says in verse 2, Hannah and uh, Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Penia. Penia had children, but Hannah did not. Two things I want us to notice about Hannah's situation. Let's take for a minute and consider Hannah's desire. Because many of us are familiar with this story, because we know how the story unfolds later on after chapter one, we know that the Lord blesses Hannah's womb and gives her a child. But in the exact moment of chapter one, Hannah is desiring to be a mom. And let me just quickly suggest that we ought to make sure that we're always sensitive on days like today to know that while there are many individuals celebrating the fact that they're mothers, there are some individuals who are grieving the fact that the desire to be a mom never happened in their lives. But notice, Beulah, the text lets us know that we see Hannah's desire. She desires to have a child. And I don't know if you agree with me this morning, Beulah, but for a lady to desire to have a child, that's not some far-fetched desire. For Hannah to be in a place where she's desiring for her womb to be touched by the Lord, that's not some, that, that, that's not some radical desire on Hannah's part. Think about this, Beulah. Hannah is not desiring a new Tesla. Hannah is not desiring some red-bottom shoes. Hannah is not desiring to have brunch or dinner at Charlie's Steakhouse. Hannah is not desiring to have a shopping spree at International Mall where she can shop till she drops. Hannah simply desires a child. And that's where somebody is today under the sound of my voice. You're dealing with the situation where you've been wrestling with God because you've been saying, God, that which I desire is not radical. That that which I desire is not big. Lord, all I want is something simple. Lord, I just want to wake up every morning and no longer feel the aches and pains in my body. Lord, all I want to do is have peace at home as opposed to hell at home. Lord, all I want to be able to do is get a good night's rest because life has been stressing me out. Someone under the sound of my voice, you know how it feels to be in the shoes of Hannah when you're not asking something big, you're not asking something large, but you just want the Lord to do something simple in your life. And if that's you today, my brother, if that's you today, my sister, here's the million dollar question that God is asking each and every one of us. God wants to know even when he is not giving us those basic desires that we have in our lives. God wants to know, will we trust his heart even when we can't trace his hand? Did you hear what I said? God wants to know this morning, even when he's not moving the way we want him to move, God wants to know, do we have enough faith to trust his heart, even when we can't trace his hand? God wants to know, even in the midnight hour, do you trust me enough to know that I love you too much to leave you or forsake you, even until the end of the world? God is asking somebody today, I want to know, do you trust me enough? 
to know that I'm too wise to make a mistake. I want to know, do you trust me enough to know that I'm sovereign, which means I can do what I want to do, when I want to do it, how I want to do it, and I don't owe anyone an explanation because I'm God and God all by myself. God is asking somebody this morning, in spite of your fears and in spite of the tears that may be in your eyes, God wants to know, can you trust my heart even when you can't trace my hand? Are you able to say like Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him? Notice Hannah's desire. Not something big. It's not something elaborate. Hannah simply wants a child. But notice, Beulah, it is because of her unfulfilled desire that her desire now leads her to a dilemma. Here it is. Hannah has to be on the outside, is on the outside looking in every Mother's Day. Can't you see it on the screen of your anointed imagination, Beulah? Hannah, when she walks through the mall, she sees lots of individuals going to Hallmark to buy Mother's Day cards. And all Hannah can think to herself as well, maybe next year. Here it is. She goes down to the park. And she sees little children playing with their mother. And Hannah says, well, maybe one day God will grant me my desire." Here it is, Hannah, she makes her way over to, to the special restaurants. And here it is, she sees so many families celebrating Mother's Day. And Hannah has no children at the table. Hannah is dealing with a dilemma. But here is the good news, two pieces of good news that God wants to remind each and every one of us on today. If you are currently dealing with a dilemma, God wants us to know, number one, that your dilemma is not your destiny. That, 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 that is to say, my brothers and my sisters, that you have to remind yourself that whatever you're going through, your condition is not your conclusion. You, you have to know that we serve a God who specializes in putting commas in sentences where individuals will put periods. God wants somebody to know today that whatever you're going through, it's temporary. <laughs> all, all right, y'all, y'all, y'all want some Bible with that? Because I can tell y'all not feeling me. Listen, please understand that whatever you're going through is temporary. Understand that your dilemma is not your destiny. Pastor, how do you know that? Because please keep in mind in Psalm 23, when David wrote, when David wrote the 23rd Psalm, David did not say, yea, though I stay in the valley of the shadow of death. David did not say, yea, though I live in the valley of the shadow of death. David did not say, yea, though I build a 4,000 square foot house with a pool in the backyard in the valley of the shadow of death. But David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And I wish I had some witnesses under the sound of my voice who can get happy off of that one word through, that one word through, which means that I'm not staying where I am, which means things aren't always going to stay the same. But what I'm going through is simply temporary. I wish you'd help me preach at this point. Look at somebody and say what you're going through is temporary. I, 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 I know, Beulah, that, that you all, that, that this won't hit home in a state like Florida. But please understand, if winter must give way to spring, and if spring must give way to summer, and if summer must give way to fall, surely your problems have to give way to some relief after a while. Listen, my, my grandmother would say it this way. Whenever you're going through a tough time, you ought to just say, this too shall pass. <laughs> they, they, these tears, when you find yourself crying late in the midnight hour, you ought to just say, this too shall pass. <laughs> when you find yourself going through a situation, when you don't know whether you're coming or whether you're going, you ought to just say, this too shall pass. Let me push this train. God wants us to know if you're dealing with a dilemma. Number one, that your dilemma is not your destiny. But can I give you something that will help you even in the moment? 
God wants to remind us that our dilemmas don't define us. Ah. Because notice, beloved, even though Hannah is dealing with a dilemma, she's still showing up for life. And and, uh, let me give it to you this way. Even though Hannah is at a point in her life where she cannot carry life within her, she's still carrying on in life. Even though things aren't going the way that Hannah wants them to go, Hannah is still waking up every morning and going on with life. And can I tell you something this morning, Beulah? Sometimes when you're going through something, you have to celebrate the small victories in life. Sometimes you have to give yourself a pat on the back and say the fact that I made myself get up out of bed, the fact that I made myself brush my teeth, the fact that I made myself put on some clothes, I need to celebrate the fact that I haven't lost my mind, that I haven't thrown in the towel. Hannah wants somebody to know today that your dilemma does not define you. Hannah wants somebody to know today, yes, you might have cancer, but you can still be courageous. Yes, you may have gone through a divorce, but you can still be determined. Yes, you might be going through problems, but you can still keep pressing. Hannah wants somebody to know today that your dilemma doesn't define you. Uh, Bibula, you all have to bear with me that this is my first Mother's Day not being with my mom. It's been heavy on my heart, but I'm reminded uh, when I was back in Virginia, mom, she's very frugal. She's very resourceful. And so uh, mom, unlike a lot of you ladies, she, she doesn't like to, sp- she doesn't like to spend a lot of money, nor does she like to go shopping. But one area that she does like to go shopping, and you all can fact check this when she comes in a few months, make sure that her son's not lying. (laughs) One area that she she enjoys grocery shopping. And so when we were back in Virginia before we transitioned here to Florida, uh, we used to go to this store called Harris Teeter. Some of y'all familiar with Harris Teeter? And so some of you who are familiar with Harris Teeter, uh, you might recall, well, before I get there, we, we, first time we went to Harris Teeter together, uh, we veered to the right. And that's where all of the produce is. And so I was getting ready to pick up some produce. And mom said, before you pick up that produce, let me show you this one section over here. So we made our way over there. And as we made our way to this section, it was the marked down produce. And so I said to her, I said, Mom, why is this produce marked down? She said, look at the sign. And the sign basically was saying that the produce was marked down because some of the produce was, it wasn't old, but it was simply bruised. And because it was beat up, yes, sir, bruised and beat up, it was marked down. So when I saw that, saw that over there, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not feeling that. I'm going back over there to get the produce that I want. But here's a secret that I've never shared with her that she's about to discover now as she's watching. Uh, After that trip, the first place I went was back to the Markdown (laughs) produce. And, and, And Beulah, I kid you not, the very first time I went back by myself, I noticed something on the on the sign that I had not noticed before. The sign said, mark down produce, but then underneath it, it said, just because we're bruised doesn't mean that we're not valuable. Ah, I wish I had about three witnesses under the sound of my voice who can say, that's my testimony on today, that just because I'm bruised, does not mean I'm not valuable. (laughs) That just because I've been through some stuff does not mean that I'm still not worthy. That just because I sometimes walk with my head held down does not mean that God can still not use me. Do I have any witnesses under the sound of my voice who can testify on today that even broken crayons still color? (laughs) I said that broken crayons still color that even though life has broken me and even 
though life has bruised me, who am I talking to today who can thank God on this morning that even though you're bruised, you're still valuable. I got to push this train. <laughs> we, we see number one, Hannah's situation. We see her desire and we see her dilemma. But then notice number two, we see Hannah's irritation. Can the church say irritation? irritation. When we read verse six, we discover that Penia, who is able to have children, constantly and consistently provokes Hannah because she's unable to have children. Isn't it interesting, Beulah, that the same energy that, that Penia used to discourage Hannah is the same energy that Penia could have used to encourage Hannah. It, it, isn't it interesting that the same mouth that Penia used to put Hannah down is the same mouth that Penia could have used to lift Hannah up. And if I had, if I wanted to hold you guys here all day, I would simply ask the question, do you all know anyone who has a Penia spirit? People who just, it seems as though they live to get on your last good nerve. People who just are intent and intentional about making life hard for you. People who don't want to, people who don't mean you any good and people who just always have something negative to say anybody know about people that have a penny of spirit people who even though they could help you they set out to harm you but how many of you are glad today that in spite of all the pennies that you may work with in spite of all the pennies you may live with in spite of all the pennies you might even come to church with how many of you are glad today that you serve a God who who knows how to handle your haters. If I hold my peace, let the Lord fight my battles. Victory shall be mine. Look, notice her irritation. She, she, she has to deal with Penia, someone who doesn't care about her situation. That, that was the sub point there. Well, notice the second thing that the, the second principle the text teaches us. Not only does she have to deal with someone who does not care about her situation, she also has to deal with someone who doesn't understand her situation. Beulah, we, we got to read this. Look, look at what verse 8 says in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Notice what the text says. Why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? Now watch what this knucklehead says. <laughs> Elkanah, who is Hannah's husband, look what he says in the B clause of verse 8, Beulah. You have me. Isn't that better than having Ten sons. What I would give and what I would pay, Beulah Baptist Institutional Church, what I would give and what I would pay to see the response of some of you ladies if the man in your life comes to you and says, why are you sad and why are you down hard? Why are you downtrodden? Aren't I enough? Beulah, I know I'm not by myself this morning. Can, can you imagine how Hannah must have got her neck going when Elkanah has the unmitigated goal to ask her, why are you sad? Aren't I enough? Can, can you imagine some of the words that some of you ladies would have said to the man in your life? H had a man come to you and said, why are you sad that you can't have children? Surely I'm a nebula. I would give my paycheck to see. 
I'd give a month's paycheck to see how you'd respond. This brother has the nerve to come to her and say, baby, I'm enough. Let me push this train. Listen, Hannah's life reminds us that sometimes there are seasons in our lives where those who are closest to us don't understand what we're going through. That the people who we do life with day in and day out, sometimes they don't understand the tears that we cry. That sometimes they don't understand the fears that we have. That sometimes they don't understand why it's nothing personal, but in the words of Monica, sometimes it's just a day that we go through when we want to be all by ourselves. But here is the good news this morning. And I just believe I've got some company in the camp who can testify. The good news this morning is that even when others don't understand us, we serve a God who understands us. We serve a God who understands how we feel. We serve a God who understands when we're going through the tough times of life. The Bible lets us know that Jesus Christ is our high priest who sympathizes with us in our weakness. Let me give it to you this way. How many of us are glad this morning that even when other people don't understand us, we can still say what a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry not some things but everything to God in prayer here it is Hannah we see Hannah's situation we now see how her situation leads to irritation but notice beloved Hannah's situation and her irritation moves her to supplication she doesn't start cussing she doesn't start fussing she doesn't tell Elkanah, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. The Bible lets us know that Hannah stands up. She leaves the room and the Bible would let us know that she falls on bended knee and cries out to the Lord just as I am. And notice quickly the three movements of Hannah's prayer. We first see that Hannah prays, that Hannah humbly prays. Because if you notice what the text says right there in verse 11, the text says, and she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, catch this key word, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. Here's the key word I want us to focus in on, Beulah. Notice when Hannah falls on bended knee in prayer to God, she says, if, when Hannah prays to God, she does not demand anything of God. She does not tell God what he needs to do. But in a posture of humility, Hannah says, if you answer my prayer. And can I tell you something, Beulah? That there's some false doctrine and false theology going around in certain camps that tell us that we can tell God what to do. We can tell God how to move. We can tell God how to answer our prayers. We're going to look at this a little bit more in depth in a couple of weeks. But please understand, Beulah, when we go to God in prayer, we are going to God in prayer not to tell him what he has to do. But we go to him in a position of humility and we simply ask him to do it. You all remember Daniel chapter 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro thrown in the fiery furnace. And here it is. They said, we know that our God is well able to deliver. But then they finished that prayer. But they said, but if he chooses not to, we will not bow down. The three Hebrew, three Hebrew boys remind us of this. They remind us that when we go to God in prayer, yes, we acknowledge that he has the power to change our situation. But in humility, we also acknowledge that it's his prerogative if he chooses to do it. 
Don't, don't, don't be fooled this morning. Don't be deceived this morning, Beulah. Sometimes we will pray and we will pray and we will pray and we will pray some more. And sometimes the answer will still be no. That God won't always answer our prayers how we want him to. That God won't always move the way we want him to. But how many of you are glad that God reminds us through the story of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, that even when God says no, that even when God says, I won't remove the thorn from you, God says, I'm not just going to leave you there, but I'm going to give you my grace because my grace is sufficient in your weakness. Notice number one, the text lets us know that Hannah prays Humbly, she humbly prays. But then notice number two, the text also lets us know that Hannah prays consistently. Can the church say consistently? Because notice it's right there in verse 12. The text says, and as she continued praying to the Lord. Here's a question that we have to ask ourselves, Beulah. How long... Have we been praying? How long have we been praying for that which we're going through? How many minutes and hours and days and months have we been praying about the dilemma that we're currently dealing with? Please understand that in this microwave generation, in this downloadable generation, we just always think that all we have to do is simply say a quick prayer unto God and we just expect God to move. No, some of us need to get back to the days of old when the saints would spend time on their knees, hours upon hours praying, crying out to the Lord. Christ says in the book of Luke that we ought to always pray. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians that we are to pray without ceasing. And it was Jonathan Edwards who once said that prayer for the believer ought to be like breath and breathing for everybody else. Here it is, number one, the text teaches us that we ought to pray with a spirit of humility. The text teaches us, number two, that we ought to pray consistently. But then notice, number three, we see in the, in the prayer of Hannah that Hannah prays silently. There it is, right there in verse 13. Seeing her lips moving, but hearing no sound, Eli thought she had been drinking. I love this because I'm guilty of it as well. But Beulah, let's be honest with ourselves. Sometimes in the Baptist tradition, more specifically in the black church tradition, sometimes we mistakenly equate volume with effectiveness. Sometimes we think the louder we pray, we think the louder we speak, that that's a prayer that that really moves the heart and the hand of God. And I'm not saying that those prayers don't move the hand in the heart of God. But how many of you know today that God also hears when we pray to him silently? I remember on this Mother's Day thinking back to the many times where I witnessed my mother pray silently. I remember, Beulah, when I was in high school, my senior year, our basketball team had made it to the regional conference. I, did, I chose not to play basketball that year, and so we were at the basketball game, me and my best friend, Marcus Carter. The team had run out of the tunnels, and when the team had run out, Marcus and I, we stood to celebrate and applaud the team. As we stood to applaud and celebrate the team, there was a sharp pain that I felt in my back. That pain resonated and stayed with me for the entire game. We walked out when the game was over, literally walking back to Marcus's car. The pain was so severe that I had to walk bent over. Marcus said, Alan, what's wrong? What's going on? I said, man, I don't know what it is, but there's this pain in my back. Went home that night, told mom, said, mom, there's this pain in my back. And all of a sudden, the first thing she did after asking me how how I was feeling, she fell on her knees and started praying to the Lord. 
awakened the next morning and this pain was still severe in my back. So now mom and I, we jump in the car and we go to urgent care at Kaiser Permanente. The doctors, they take some x-rays and I kid you not, these are the only words the doctor said to my mom, your son is in trouble, he needs some help, get him to the hospital. We leave Kaiser Permanente, which is in Woodbridge, Virginia. We now make our way to Fairfax Hospital. There we discover that I had a collapsed lung. During that entire stay, they tried so many different things to get the lung to come back up. Because all of those things did not prevail or because they uh, were to no end or were not successful, the doctor had then come and told mom, you, we have to perform surgery on your son. Long story short, surgery happened on that Sunday, and because the lung still was not progressing the way it needed to, I stayed in the hospital for nine days. And Beulah, I kid you not, though there are many memories associated with that story, I can recall every morning awakening, looking to my right, seeing my mom with her head down, and her hands open, praying, interceding, and calling out to God on behalf of her son. And how many of us are thankful this morning that as we think back and reflect on the lives of our mothers, some of us can testify, mom didn't have a lot of money to get us the latest trends and the best of clothes. Some of us can testify that mom maybe didn't do everything right and didn't do everything perfect. But how many of you this morning are thankful almost to the point of tears in your eyes that you served, that you had a mother who knew the importance and the power of prayer? Some of us. Some of us, if honest with ourselves, we're not ashamed to admit to the fact that one of the main reasons we're sitting in this place today on May 8th, 2022, is because we had a mother like Hannah who prayed silently before the Lord. That when we were out doing our own thing and had Christ far away from our mind, we had a mother who fell down on bended knee and she said, just as I am. When we look at Hannah, some of us think of our own moms. Yes, sir. Moms who are still, that's right, doc. Moms who are still praying for us. That even though we're older, even though we're adults, even though we have our own children and have been in our own careers, we have a mother who's praying for us. And as we stand to our feet on this morning, how we're thankful that we had moms, we have moms who said, just as I am, without one plea. And so today there may be someone might be someone here today who does not know Christ in the pardoning of your sins. Might be someone here today who does not know that heaven is your home. And if that's you today, we want you to come where you can declare just as I am. Is there one today? One today who wants to give their life to Christ? One today who says, just as I am, just as I am. Is there one today? One today who says, Reverend, I realize I have a spiritual dilemma. I'm in need of a savior. Maybe you already have accepted Christ into your life, but you want to make the Beulah Baptist Church your church home. If that's you, will you come?